Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Culture Connection Speaker Series, where we're talking with Americans in different fields of work who share their interest and knowledge in Russian arts, society, culture, and history. We'll see how American attitudes and tastes have changed over the years and how Americans are connecting on a cultural level with Russia. My name is Michael Beckelheimer. I'm joining you from Washington, D.C. This program is presented by the American Center of Moscow, which is supported by the American Embassy in Moscow. If you want Russian subtitles, you can select closed captioning in Russian. If you're watching on the American Center's YouTube, VK, or Telegram channels, please post comments and questions. We love questions. Ask about anything. Whenever you have a question, just put the question in and we'll get to it. So today we'll be talking about the role of Russian culture in teaching Russian history and how the West was presented in Soviet culture, which, you know, is one of our favorite themes. Our guest is Stephen Norris, professor of Russian history and director of the Habikurst Center for Russian and Post-Soviet Studies at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. Steve teaches courses on the history of the Russian Empire, history of the USSR, history of the world wars, and history at the movies. His favorite class, though, is history through literature, in which he uses the works of Lev Tolstoy and Vasily Grossman. And we'll talk about that later. Uh, I want to mention three of Steve's current projects, which we'll also talk about today. Um, one, he's creating a digital analysis and presentation of postcards that were produced and sent from the Leningrad, um, from Leningrad during the blockade, which is fascinating. He's writing a book called The History Painters about Viktor Vasnetsov and Vasily Sorikov. And he's writing a biography of Boris Efimov, the Soviet cartoonist. And um, today we're gonna talk about both of those latter projects and see some great imagery. Um, um, so you can see from Steve's biography, from the courses he teaches and his projects, how he manages to integrate arts, literature, propaganda, visuals, and national identity into this teaching of, of Russian history. Um, Steve, welcome to the series. Thank you for being here. Thank you for asking me, Michael. Happy to be here. Um, why don't we start with just a, a general discussion about how you use visuals and, and, and what sort of made this an important part of how you teach Russian history? Yeah, good question. Um, I, you know, I sort of ac fell in accidentally to a, a focus on visual sources. Um, I started out as someone who was interested in the imperial period, and particularly the period between the revolution of 1905 and, and the war in 1914. Um, and I, I guess I wanted, first of all, this, to figure out what Russians thought about the Japanese in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905. That is the precursor to this period I was interested in. And in doing so, I, I just, in the University of Virginia library where I went to graduate school, happened to, upon a book that talked about the Lubok, this, this popular print that existed in the Russian empire. Um, and that was particularly changed by the war of 1812 and then significantly changed when the lithographic process entered into Russia in the, in the early decades of the 19th century. And I was just fascinated. I was you know dazzled that there, here, here were these images that I'd never heard of that functioned as propaganda that were widespread in the Russian Empire in the War of 1904, 1905, um, and then you know traced it back all the way to 1812. That's the, that's the birth of my dissertation. Um, and and I, I can't really articulate well why it is I like visual sources. I, I didn't take art history classes in college. I've sort of taught myself art history, except that I think I respond to images in ways that my students also respond to images, which is why, why I use them so much in class. Um, it, it's difficult to get students in general, Midwestern students particularly, I'm a Midwesterner, to respond to texts. You know, you read a diary, you read a novel, you read a book about history, and they they sort of accept it at face value and they don't quite know, generally speaking, how, how to respond to it. But an image or a moving image like a film, um, students seem to be willing and ready to ask questions, interpret differently, argue with each other. Um, it's, it's, it's sort of common for students to argue about movies, let's say, or images, print, you know, posters, memes they've discovered. And that translates quite well to the classroom. And I think the last thing I'll say about this in, in answer to your first question here is that, you know, images af uh, afford us a window into the past. We can see it a little more vividly that way. You know, I can describe things. I could, I could tell you what Viktor Vosnitsov's painting looks like, 
it's far better to just see it and think about how we respond to that visual, which is, of course, the major intention of the painter. Of course. Yeah, <clears throat> I could relate to that. I um, First, all of my Russian history classes were all texts and textbooks. And so I wish you had been my professor. <laughs> and um, and I sat in on, a, on a, an American history class at a university in Moscow a couple of years ago. And I was impressed that the students were giving presentations and it was very visual. You know, there were old American cartoons and um, um, prints. So it was, it's, it's a wonderful way to, to not just learn the history, but to really feel what that, what that time was like. Um, let's back up a bit. I wanna um, ask a little bit about you since you're our guest and uh, find out um, how you became interested in Russian history and, and then why you became a Russian history professor. Yep, my favorite subject myself. Um, thanks, Michael. So I do have a pretty good story about how I got interested in Russian history. I mean, the, the, the first thing I'd say is that I have no Russian ethnic background. Um, I'm, I'm a sort of mutt of the British Isles in terms of my family background, with a little bit of German thrown in. But I am a child of the 1980s and therefore grew up at a time when there were only, you know, three networks in America and the nightly news every night at 530 in the St. Louis area where I grew up. Uh, usually started with something about the Soviet Union. And I'm also of the age where movies, you know, like Red Dawn, Rocky IV came out right at the, you know, when I was 12 and 13. So they were, they were the right time for me to see it. And I did. So I, I had this image and kind of fascination with the Soviet Union as a teenager and a child of the 80s. And I went to college in 1990. So right after the revolutions in 89 and decided very quickly, I thought I was going to go and major in history to be a, a lawyer. That's what I told my parents. Um, and then decided quickly that I didn't want to be a lawyer, that I was just fascinated by the way history was taught at the collegiate level. And that that all matters because in the fall of 1991, I had decided starting my sophomore year that I no longer wanted to be a lawyer. And I was thinking about maybe going to graduate school eventually and studying history. And that fall, I took my first ever Russian history class. It was just a survey of Russian history. And of course, a week before it began is when the coup attempt against Gorbachev took place. So I was learning Russian history um, at a time when Russian history, Soviet history in this case, was was dramatically changing. And about halfway through the semester, my professor announced that he was leading a trip to the Soviet Union through the American Express in tourist partnership that would that would land in the Soviet Union on January 6, 1992. We'd spend seven days in first St. Petersburg and then Moscow. I signed up. It was eight hundred ninety nine dollars for the, you know, airfare and hotels in the Soviet Union. I took my final exams in mid-December, went home, and the Soviet Union collapsed, of course, while I was at home waiting to go. So we, I, we still went. I landed in, in not the Soviet Union, but Russia on January 6, 1992, which is three days after shock therapy started. So that's a, a, a way of saying that that trip, of course, profoundly changed the way I viewed Russia, viewed Russian history. It was the first time I'd ever met Russians or anyone in the former Soviet Union, not just Russians, but people living in St. Petersburg. Um, and it was a time also, in spite of the economic challenges right then and there, that people in the streets, because of course we're riding these buses that said in tourists, would come up to us and just want to talk to us. You know, like they felt mm -hmm. free to talk to us at a time that maybe they hadn't before and and sit down with us in a tea shop or, a, a you know, the, the Dom Kanigi in St. Petersburg and just sort of ask us about our lives just like you're doing and, and share their own lives. It was, it was absolutely fascinating. And it made me then want to learn the language. And so that, you know, that in that story right there is the a longer story of then I went to graduate school and learned Russian, spent the summer of 97 in Kazan, and I'm still doing this, still fascinated um, by what I discovered, I guess, in January, 1992. I love that story. And I know we're here to talk to you, but I'll tell the story also. Um, I, have a, I had a similar experience, you know, studying Russian at that time. And it's um, it just, I always love to hear how people are hooked on Russia and Russian culture because a lot of Americans, I'm sure you've experienced this, ask, well, why are you studying Russian? Why do you care about Russia? What is your fascination? And there's just something about it that is so um, appealing and it just really, you know, takes a hold of you. Um, our speaker last week thought he was going to be an English major but he took a Russian language class and then that completely changed his life, you know? So it happens. Um, let me ask you uh, about your students uh, because right now we're in, you teach undergraduate students. Right now we're in a period where I assume those students aren't studying abroad in Moscow this semester. <laughs> so 
um, and this was always something that, you know, that we were able to do. Um, what brings students to um, want to study Russia at your school? And tell us a little bit about Miami of Ohio. And you said you're in the Midwest. And what's, right. what's this mean? So Miami of Ohio is a mid-level public university in the state of Ohio. It's it's sort of the liberal arts public university in Ohio. It's you know Ohio State is the giant in terms of size, but and therefore Miami's a little bit smaller. I think there's about eighteen to twenty thousand undergraduates here, um, and always has been much more of an undergraduate focused liberal arts in a traditional American university way. Um, it doesn't have a long history of studying Russia. I mean, we, we you know we had people who taught the Russian language and Russian history from starting from the Cold War on. But we got this major donation, um, an endowment from a former professor named Walter Havinghurst that sort of created the center that I run in 2000. Um, so it, it, so that's part of the answer. The other part is in terms of why students still study Russian. Of course, it's you have to say here that in America presently, just about every force working toward a, a undergraduate student runs a, you know, tells them not to study a language. Um, we don't study languages early on like the, like you do in Russia um, or in other, you know, parts of Europe. Uh, you traditionally pick up a language in high school. The Russian is rarely taught anymore in high school. There was an investment in the Cold War that went away in the 1990s. So it really takes someone who's willing to want to challenge themselves with a very difficult language and buck all these trends that, you know, wants you to sign off and get rid of your language requirement right away in college to study Russian. And I say that too, because, you know, our, our enrollments in Russian have plummeted. That's true of other languages like Chinese and Japanese. You know, hard languages don't really sell very well. Um, so the students who do find our way into the Having Her Center, into our Russian language classes, do so because they've had a moment, kind of like the one you described, Michael, kind of like the one I described, Maybe they've read Dostoevsky in high school. Maybe they learned about World War II and the Soviet efforts in World War II. Um, maybe they have an idea that they want to work for an NGO, uh, you know, of some kind, the State Department even. Um, we, we have a, a fair number of ROTC students who want to learn a language and are willing to invest in a difficult language for practical purposes. So we have this really interesting mix of students. And even though we our enrollments aren't very good, at least in the way that our administrators look at things, our, our students are very good, uh, and and they're 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 diverse. They're interesting, right? There, there's the nerdy literature type. There's the interested in Soviet history kind of geek, um, and they tend to we, we tend to produce really good students. We've had I think now five years in a row where one of our students has been a Fulbright semifinalist or finalist to study Russian language somewhere, not in Moscow anymore, but in Bishkek. Um, our, our last person who was in Russia uh, was in Novosibirsk. I think she was, she received a Fulbright and that was the COVID year and she got pulled out, you know, in March. But it's, you know, it's still, it, many of the ways that we got interested in Russia are still true. You read something, you're fascinated by this place that seems so different. Uh, tell us about when you were last in Russia. I was last in Russia in 2019. I, I was attended a conference in Tumen in Siberia at the university there that was the first part of a, a, um, a conference that produced a book called Picturing Russian Empire. It was my first time in Siberia, it was fascinating. Um, and then I, we had a day trip to Tobolsk, which I really love too, the, the traditional capital of Siberia where there's still this Kremlin there. Um, and that, that resulted in fact in a book published recently by Oxford University Press called Picturing Russian Empire, which has very short chapters, something like 50 chapters of you know five or six pages each. Um, that each deal with an image that has something to do with empire across time, you know, all the way from Ivan the Fourth to the present. And so, what was the image that you wrote about? Uh, Boris Yefimov's cartoon. I'll show you later. It's a uh, it's a really interesting cartoon from 1965 that critiques the placement of um, intercontinental ballistic missiles in Europe. Okay, this is this is great. There there are two big themes that we're going to talk about today. One is history history of Russia, history with literature, with art, and then also Boris Efimov, because I know you're, you've done a lot of work on that, and, and you have visuals, um, some images to show us. Um, why don't we start with teaching Russian history with art? Um, so we've already started to, to touch on that. Um, you're writing a book about um, Viktor Vasnetsov and Vasily Svirikov. Um, what is this about and how do you use them in your history courses? Yep, so I'm, I'm gonna hopefully 
share just so that we get a visual here. Let's see if it's working. Um, but the, the, the book is called the, the History Painters or Russia's History Painters. We're sort of going back and forth with the title. And it's part of a, a book series I co-edit with my colleague Gina Vrutin at the University of Illinois called Russian Shorts, which is published through Bloomsbury Press. And it's, uh, you know, I think the, the pitch line we used is it's short books about big topics. So they're 40,000 to 42,000 words. That is pretty short. Um, and, and the aim is, you know, the audience I think is for students or just people who aren't scholars and who are interested in parts of Russia and Russian history. And I, I, I've i been fascinated by Vasnetsov and Surikov for a long time, especially going many, many times to the Tretyakov Gallery of the Russian Museum in St. Petersburg over the years. And just these massive canvases that every Russian I speak to seems to know and know well, and yet Americans don't. They don't tend to know Russian artists at all. And if they do, it's usually the early 20th century avant-garde. Um, Malevich and Kandinsky and people like that. And, and you know, maybe then Ilya Repin, that is some of the, the wanderers, the so-called wanderers of the, of the mid-19th century. So Vasnetsov and Surikov are incredibly popular, as I've come to learn and understand in Russia, and yet not very well known in America and not often written about in America. I mean, again, scholars tend to write about the early wanderers and Repin, let's say, or the avant-garde of the 20th century, or Soviet art, you know, um, socialist realist art. And, and Vastinsov and Surikov tend to get left to the side. Um, I don't know if my slides are up, or they... I don't see your slides. Yeah. So the book is is mostly um, a an effort to just t tell their story through their most popular paintings. Introduce a reader to, you know, something like Bagatiri or... Um, morning of the execution of the Strelzi, that's the Surikov's massive canvas. So how how do Russians, based on your research, and I know you can't speak for all Russians, but you're, as I understand, looking at how Russians, how these artists have helped shape Russian identity. Um, what are your conclusions there? Well, part of part of what I what I do, um, and I wish I could. I'm trying to get these things on screen. I'm not sure what's going on, and I, I realize that's an awkward pause here. But, but part of what I want to do is show how it was that these painters became significant. That is the process by which they became familiar to almost anyone living in the late Russian Empire or throughout the Soviet Union, and that's partly through um, their talent, of course, but the way in which their works and their paintings coincided with the rise of mass public, mass circulation magazines like Neva, Wheatfield in the late imperial period, um, Krokodil, the, the Soviet satirical journal, they were used again and again and appeared in newspapers like Pravda, Izvestia, and therefore became replicated a lot. They, they were familiar in other words and made familiar uh, in ways that are quite fascinating. And, and so I trace that story too. It's not just about the process of creating the painting itself, but as a historian, I'm just as interested in the way in which these paintings were received and popularized in first the empire and then the Soviet Union. Can I ask a question for the audience, um, for those of you watching, if you have particular thoughts or ideas about Surikov or Vasnetsov um, and you'd like to share those, we would love to hear them. Or if you have questions, please feel free to put those in the chat. So. I love that we're talking about this, Steve. As you're, as you're, are you trying to pull up those images? I am trying to pull up. I, you know, there's, they're here, and maybe there's a, there's a technical person out there who can help me here. I'm looking at them on my screen, but I, and I, we tried this ahead of time, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. But I, I, I love that we're talking about this. My last trip to Russia was um, in 21, the end of 21, and I didn't know it would be my last time there for a while. Um, but I made a point for some reason to, instead of working on the project I went to work on, which I worked a little bit, but I really took time to just enjoy Russian art, and which usually that was always on the side when I would go. I'd go to a museum here or there. But I went to Abramtseva and Polyanova, and I went to Vesnikov's, um, Vesnikov's um, home in Moscow um, and some other places, and just I really appreciated him, Mesnesko, for the first time, actually. So I love that you're you're here to, to talk about him. And I understand that you use you use him in your in your history classes, right? And Surikov. How does that work? What 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 do they bring to the story of Russian history? How do you use them on what themes? 
So I, you know, I one painting that I use a lot is is Vasily Surikov's Morning of the Execution of the Strelci, which I which I have mentioned before, which which appeared at the Wanderers show in 1881. Interestingly, on the exact same day, the show opened on the same day that Alexander II, the Tsar of Russia, was assassinated just a few blocks away. So, in fact, people who attended the opening of that Wanderers show heard the explosions a few blocks away, and there was and I there was a lot of talk about whether or not a painting, a massive canvas which is the day that Peter the Great, or at least the imagined one day, that Peter the Great oversaw the execution of these guards that had rebelled while he was in Europe. Um, there was debate about whether you should, and then the, the painting is somewhat sympathetic to the Streltsy, these guards that were created by Ivan IV and that were executed by under Peter the Great's orders, and in some, in some cases by Peter the Great. And um, Surikov was a little sympathetic to the Streltsy. He saw it as, you know, the, the way that the old gives way to the new, but he saw it as a tragedy that affected entire families in an old way of life. Um, so here this painting comes out that's sympathetic to rebels against a czar at a time when rebels against another czar assassinate him um, in 1881. Uh, students like that, that's interesting. They also, it's it's a even though it was created in 1881, it acts as a great shorthand and discussion tool for thinking about Peter the Great's reforms because it's, it's not just about westernization and changing Russia in very, the empire in very fundamental ways, it's about you know, getting rid of the old, which means killing people. And the, the guards that he thought proved that Russia was backward and then was holding it back and not, you know, and unable to become a European power. So he came back home and oversaw the tortures and executions. And so, you know, students, they, they, like, they look at this, they find it interesting. They debate whether or not Surikov thought, you know, painted Peter the Great as haughty and out of touch and mean, or whether it was more like you need to break some eggs to make the omelet situation. Um, so yeah, and, and and I think that's true of most of Surikov's paintings. Uh, the Conquest of Siberia by Yermak, which, which is another powerful one where it's really, it's, it's not obvious what the message of that painting is. Is it is it pro Yermak and pro conquest of Siberia? Is it much more on the side of the indigenous Siberians who are fighting for their way of life? Um, there's multiple ways to interpret that painting that Surikov particularly does quite well. And then with Vasnetsov, it's a, it's, uh, you know, sort of myth history and, and fairy tales and legends that allow students to see the way in which that, that particular Russian painter imagined deep pasts and connections to kind of timeless, almost primordial notions of Russianness that were circulating in the late 19th century. It, but isn't that a common theme with, with art, especially older art, where we all go to museums and we stand in front of these canvases and we see these um, idealized paintings of what our past looked like. Um, certainly we have that, <laughs> you know, here in Washington, there's a lot of, you know, idealized imagery. Um, and I can see where standing in front of the, the, the painting of the, the, the execution of the Streltsy, you know, you see there's, there's, there's suffering people in that one woman's agonizing face and you have this sympathy for them. And then you think, well, these were the, the people who are, you know, rebelling against the czar. Um, so, how do you, um, what, do, what, do, what do students do with that information? Like, how do they process um, why that was painted and why that that the importance of the the relationship between the czar and the people? Right, that's a really good point, Michael. I'm glad you bring it up. So, you know, I think one of the things that the paintings help students understand better than they might normally not otherwise, is um, the fact that that these mythic, legendary notions of national identity, which were created in Russia, but as you mentioned elsewhere too, we have, you know, in, the, in America, we have the Washington crossing, the Delaware paintings, uh, for example, and these big paintings in the Capitol building that that sort of capture these moments in history that are that have become almost myth. Um, this is all a 19th century creation. It's, it's a, it was a time in history where painters, artists, some political figures, you know, the emperors sometimes in Russia, not, not all the times, um, invested a lot of mental effort into creating this idea of a, in this case, a Russia that was a nation within an empire that had deep roots and that could, you know, unite people along national and ethnic lines. Um, and so it's it, the fact that the painting, like Morning of the Execution of the Strelsi was created in the 1881, but harkens back to an event in the late 17th century allows students to think about that process that it's it's not it, it's not as if the, the russian nation existed from time immemorial it was it too was a historical process just like it was elsewhere in europe um, and then at the same time so that's part of it right that that's a kind of 
very intellectual way of thinking about this, but allows them to think about how nations are created in history and come about in history. And then, you know, it allows you to think about the actual event itself. Of course, um, Surikov spent a lot of time reading about the Petrine era, um, one of the diaries of one of the foreign observers who witnessed the executions of the Streltsy, there were many of them, had just reappeared. It, it, it had been censored for a long time in the Russian Empire because it was so um, vivid in the way it described these executions. And so Surikov was one of the first people to read this republished diary and thought, I oh, wasn't that interesting. This is not the way I've learned about the past. Um, and so that informed the way he he painted that painting. And, and, and you know, as, as someone who I like a lot and as a historian who, who wants us to think about history in the way I think we ought to, that is it's complicated. There might be multiple um, valid interpretations of an event in the past. Um, Surikov really transfers that well on canvas. You can, you can see it in other words and, and see it instantly and then think about it a little more across time about what it exactly is trying to tell us. You know, he painted that in 1881 that was the same year that the Pushkin Monument went up in Moscow. And Pushkin, in the early 1800s, he wrote um, a couple of very important works about Peter the Great. He was also trying to understand Russian history and the role of Peter the Great. Um, how do you present Peter the Great to your students? What does, how, how, how big is he um, in your course on Russian history? Yeah, he's, I mean, he's obviously, you can't get away from Peter the first, right, and Peter the Great, uh, the, the era of the greats from Peter to Catherine. Um, you know, I, th I think that students respond to Peter the Great still in, in very interesting ways, and Catherine for that matter, too. They're, they're larger than life. Um, they've probably, you know, they, it's one of the rare instances where students come to my history of the Russian Empire class and have heard about the rulers. I think when I grew up, of course, I you know I knew who the Soviet leaders were, and I didn't have to be told who Lenin was later or Gorbachev. Now, you know, students don't really know that, but they they know of Peter the Great, they know of Catherine the Great. Um, sometimes in the latter case, Catherine the Great through the 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 two series, one called The Great and one Catherine the Great, one of which aired on HBO. Um, and and they're just fascinated by this person who was six foot seven and thought you know he should change everything almost overnight. And I think the way that traditionally we talk about Peter the Great and students respond to them is whether um, it was best to do, you know, throw everything at once quickly as possibly and radically change Russia or instead try to reform across time. It's a lot about his legacy, in other words. And, and it, you know, the, the sort of impact and legacies and impact on ordinary people of the Petrine reform still fascinates students. Um, and then with Catherine, of course, it's more about really building the empire and, you know, building monuments to the empire and sort of monumentalizing the empire of Peter the Great Bronze Horseman in St. Petersburg, most famously, but another monuments that began to be built there um, and expanding it in ways that even Peter didn't. And whether again, you know, what, what, what does that tell us about empire? Um, and then the last thing I'll say on this subject is, you know, one of the one of the things that has taken place in the historiography of Russia since the 1990s, that is to say, since I've been in the business, is, is the so-called imperial turn. You know, when I, when I first took that class in Russian history, it was so much more focused on politics. We learned a lot about the revolutionaries from the Decemberist onwards. Um, and some of that was informed by Soviet historiography. And instead, you know, with, with the collapse of the Soviet empire in 1991, um, asked us all to rethink everything we thought we knew about modern Russian history. And that and it began to lead people and the opening of archives too, to think about the way Russia has been an empire and what that means exactly, how, how it built an empire similar to or dissimilar in other ways to European empires, how people in Tashkent or Tallinn lived in Russian empires. And, and so that's part of the story too. It's not just, you know, of course we get the personalities like Peter and Catherine, but we also get the people, the ordinary people who were transformed by the policies that they, they oversaw. Right, I understand in the field of Russian studies, there is, a, there is this movement to, to, to um, a, sort of this looking at Russia as a colonial, you know, empire. Um, where, do you, where do you sort of stand on that? Um, somewhat bit of debate between um, Russia as 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 just a sovereign, you know, uh, Russia as Russia versus Russia as a, as an empire, and and the and bringing in all of these um, groups along the periphery into the conversation or into the study of Russia. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm very much part of this turn, I suppose, and and one of the sub debates of this imperial turn was whether or not. Russia created itself or was, or was able to create itself as a nation in the 19th century uh, 
um, and and, it, and it, as opposed to just an empire. So the for Russian speakers, of course, is the question of Rasiski versus Ruski. That is the imperial civic term used for Russianness, Rasiski, um, which means anyone belonging or a subject to the Russian Empire versus Ruski, which is, of course, ethnic Russian. And the conventional argument that first emerged in the 1990s and early 2000s when I was in graduate school and writing my dissertation was that Russia functioned as an empire at the expense of Russia as a nation. Um, that is, czars and other political figures didn't foster a sense of belonging along ethnic or national lines because they were much more interested in building a great empire. And often the proof used for this argument was that it was in Russia that, so it, so it was thought, that the empire collapsed only in World War I. That is, the revolution sort of proves that Russians weren't united around this sort of sense of ethnic national belonging and instead the empire fraction. Um, I disagree. I, 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 that's part of my work has been to, to try and demonstrate that an, an empire and a nation can function simultaneously and that there sometimes there's overlap, sometimes it's difficult to tell the difference, but that certainly by the end of the 19th century, there was there were pretty clear markers of Russianness as a nation and that even the czars, Alexander III and Nicholas II particularly, um, tried to, I don't know, project an image of an imperial nation, which is something of an oxymoron, but nonetheless, um, it existed. And I think Vasnetsov and Surikov are proof of this, especially Vasnetsov. That is, Vasnetsov was one of the artists who kind of put out there the items on a menu of Russianness that Russians could consume. Oh yeah, you know, Bagatir, that's that's what makes me Russian. Or defending the land like the Bagatirs do, That's that makes me Russian. Or sacrifice, like in the the, the painting, the Prince Igor after the battle with the Pala of the Sea, right? This is something that makes us Russian in a national sense, not just an imperial sense. So in that in that way, it's it's not too dissimilar from the way in which English and British overlap as national and imperial terms. I mean, it's, it's obviously they're different in the way they sound, which is why the Russian case is a little more complex. But you know, these things can coexist. So you say your students come to you with the knowledge of Peter the Great, of course. Um, I imagine they've also heard of Tolstoy. And I, I, I would like to talk about your course, History Through Literature, and how you use Tolstoy or Vasily Grossman um, in those courses. Um, talk about that. Yeah, so I, I very early on when I got my job here, I was asked, as most young professors are asked to do, um, create some classes, some dream classes, you know, kind of make them your own. And I had had read <laughs> War and Peace for the first time when I was in Moscow doing my dissertation research in 1999. And I brought it, this is back in the day, you know, no Kindles, no eBooks. So we had to think very carefully about what books we're going to take with us, physical books for a long stay in another country. So I thought, oh, War and Peace, I've never read it. It's long, it'll take me months to read this thing. I, I read it in two weeks. It was, it was absolutely mind blowing to me. Um, and I loved it, you know, greatest thing ever written, right? Shocking. The fact that you read it in two weeks is mind blowing to me. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I couldn't put it down. I'd come home from the archives and, and just couldn't put it down. Wanted to read and read more. So when I, you know, got the, my job in 2002 and was asked to create new classes, I thought I want to, I want to teach a class where we use War and Peace as a text um, and analyze it historically. So that, that, that became the case and it, it evolved in this course now called History Through Literature so that I don't just have to teach War and Peace. I think I've taught it now 10 times. That is the course in some iteration. Um, nine times of the 10 I've taught War and Peace, which means I've read War and Peace probably 12 times at least. Um, and as you said, students, it, it's worked really well because students, of course, know at least on some level about the, the writers in the 19th century, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky. Um, and they they know also about War and Peace or they, they've heard on some level, this is supposedly a great thing and that you should at some point read it. And they're often intimidated. It is 1300 pages in its English translation. Um, so it's it's one of the great joys of that class, and one of the reasons I, I love it so much is that it's 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 my chance to introduce mm -hmm. students to this great piece of literature that asks so many interesting questions that are timeless, and the questions change you know at each reading or any given moment. Um, and once they get past the first hundred pages or so, they're usually hooked. Um, in fact, just yesterday I was talking to a colleague of mine in the hallway um, in the history department, and she had reread one piece over. Christmas. We are new, we were, we're nerds here in the history department. Um, and I told her that one of the great things about teaching this class is every time I teach one piece, there's a moment when I walk into the classroom and instead of hearing students either not talking, you know, like they get quiet when you walk in or talking about whatever they did over the weekend or whatever they're going to do over the weekend, it, I realize that they're all arguing 
sometimes with all of themselves, but sometimes just in small groups, about war and peace. Something that happened in war and peace that made them angry, that frustrated them, that they absolutely loved. It's often when Natasha leaves Prince Andre for Anatole, runs off, right, and, and is going to get married. They hate that or they love it and they want to talk about it. And it, it is, it, it is, as a teacher, one of the best moments one can have as a teacher. You, you walk in and you realize, oh my God, all the students are talking about this text. And it's proof that it still works. They respond to it. That's great. Is, is that the single text for that course or do you bring another history text? So I, I, that's where things change. I mean, that's where the format allows me to play around a little bit. I have taught it a couple times where it's just a single text and I assigned history, like, you know, secondary sources alongside of it, histories of 1812. Um, that actually doesn't work as well. I, I've abandoned that because it, you know, it's a lot to ask students to read this long novel and it, and therefore it's a lot to ask them to read sometimes dense historical works alongside of it. So the, the last few times I've taught the class, it's been um, all Tolstoy. We, we just sort of read Tolstoy and sort of think about him as someone who allows us to use fiction for historical purposes, whether it be in the kind of immediacy of time and place in Anna Karenina, right? That's, that's a novel very much about 1876 and 77 in Russia with the Russo-Turkish war looming. So you get all kinds of information about that particular moment in history and in time, or something like War and Peace, where he he's deliberately engaging with the way professional historians think about history and using fiction as a way to offer something different. And, and students really like that, that they respond to it. Um, I've also taught it where I pair it with Crime and Punishment, because it's just fascinating to me that there was a moment, if you subscribe to the Thick Journal at the time, um, in 1867 in Russia, that Crime and Punishment and War and Peace appeared in the same issues across that year. So if you were a educated Russians subscribing to this journal, you would read these two novels simultaneously. One about history, one about time and place too. Um, and then I've, I've a couple times paired it with Life and Fate, Vasily Grossman's great novel, the 20th century, the, the so-called 20th century one piece to think about how that works. And then as you mentioned, one time I taught the course entirely around Grossman, especially when Stalingrad, the the precursor to Life and Fate was appeared in English translation. And students love that too. I mean, it's these big, thick works that deal with big topics in history, big moments in history, war, invasion, patriotism, the behavior of people and time, you know, small people and big events. It just fascinates you. Well, I was going to ask about Grossman. Does that then become a Soviet history course when you use that? Uh, well, again, the, you know, it's it's a 400 level history class called uh, History Through Literature, and one of the one of the requirements in, in the history major at Miami University is to do a, a you have to do a capstone where you do history, you write a, a you know a research paper, and then you have to take a class at the 400 level that isn't a capstone that asks you as an advanced history student to really think deeply about aspects of the past that you wouldn't otherwise get. So in this case, you know, the the history through lit is is at the biggest level, it's like, what does fiction do that nonfiction that is history right. doesn't do? And how 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 do narratives function? You know, do we do we recognize that as historians we write narratives that are somewhat artificial because history never unfolds as a narrative. There's not you, you don't know you're at the beginning or middle of something when you're experiencing an event. Um, that's something both Tolstoy and Grossman wrote a lot about. And 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 how do you get inside people's heads as a historian when you lack access to sources, whereas a novelist can create these vivid characters, you know, the Shaposhnikovs in Grossman's novels or the Rostovs in War and Peace. These are amazing families that are complete inventions and yet believable. So that that's that's it's it's not necessarily an imperial course or a Soviet course. Right. It's more that's about history. narratives and, and literature. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so I um when you advise students who are working on their capstone projects, um which you do, right? Um, I do, yes. Um, what is it like when? Uh, first off, what what do they what do they want to to dive into? What really um, is interesting to your students uh, um, on this topic um, within this this um, sphere? And then, what's it like for you to have them come to you um, enthusiastic about a topic in Russian history or Russian literature? Um, and then, how do you? Um, what's your process with them to guide them? Yeah, the, great question. So I do do this, and and I don't teach the capstones often because of all, all sorts of reasons, including you know uninteresting reasons, including the fact I direct the center, but also because access to sources that are in English are is, can be somewhat thorny. 
Um, I have done specific capstones on the Russian Revolution of 1917. The revolutions is probably a better term. And that went really well. I've done a capstone on Stalinism before um, because there's there are sources available. We also have a program in our history department that our best students get to, get to sign up for or they're recruited and, and invited to, to be to graduate with honors in history where they spend three semesters doing a guided research project. And that's where one that I'm heavily involved in because we tend to get, I, I do get some students that can read another language, including Russian. Um, I'm sort of the default visual person, um, world wars person for anyone interested in those subjects. And there are many students who get interested in visuals and movies in history and literature in history, propaganda in history, um, the world wars, whether it be in Russia and the Soviet Union or elsewhere, all of whom come to me. And it's 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 great. It's such a great experience. I'm, I'm so glad we have this program because it really does allow our undergraduate students to do a three semester long investment in history in the way that we do at the, you know, the level of professors. Um, and a lot of it boils down to availability of sources and where they're willing to go. And that's always fun, actually. You, you know, you, you get students who say, I want to write something about the World War One. You say, well, you know, World War One, it was a big event, lots of sources out there. Let's let's refine it. You know, what interests you the most about World War One? What sort of sources could you imagine yourself really getting excited about? Primary sources. Where are they located exactly? Where can I help you find them? And that that ultimately ends up to something quite quite fun. You work with these students over time and they they produce fantastic work. Uh, let's switch to the Soviet period. You also teach history of the USSR. What do um what do students, American students today? How do they perceive the Soviet Union and how do they differentiate it from Russia? Yeah, excellent question. I, I think most of most students today and across time, this is this is something I do in my classes to try and correct. They, they don't see much difference and they often refer to the Soviet Union as Russia or Russians, right? Which is wrong. It's not. Um, I actually have a T-shirt that someone once bought me and my sister, I'll even say, about the 1980 ice hockey game. She went to Lake Placid and it says, you know, United States four. Russia three, which is of course not correct. The Soviet Union scored three goals in that game. Um, so I, I think part of the project of teaching a history of the Russian Empire and the Soviet history, which are two of the main classes I teach, is to think about Russia in the first case, the empire, as an empire. What does that mean exactly? Um, and to not fall into the trap of conflating empire and nation, but instead to look at how, you know, Rossiski develops and an empire develops, how an empire was successful by imperial terms right and and conquering other peoples and trying to assimilate other peoples and work them into this this hierarchy of of the way you know the way imperial peoples work and the way empires function um, and then thinking about the rise of russianness as part and parcel of the russian imperial project of the 19th century so, and i use other examples too you know the the, the um, boom in jewish public culture in the russian empire in spite of the heavy oppression that the russian imperial state you know, brought to bear on the Jewish populations of the Russian Empire. Yiddish boomed, writers like Sholem Alechem created these wonderful characters like Tevye, the Dairyman. Um, and to think about, you know, empire as creating national identities and, and not always to call it just Russia or Russian, but that it's part of the Rasiski project. And then the Soviet Union, the class is, of course, somewhat similar that how, how the Soviet Union was built, how it was created as an anti-empire, became something more like an empire, why that paradox is a fundamental way of understanding the Soviet experience, and how people who were Russian and would describe themselves as Russian were part of this project and this experiment, but how people who weren't Russian and wouldn't describe themselves as Russian, you know, Latvians or Kazakhs, um, were part of the Soviet experience too. So reducing it just to one word or and, and simplifying it is, of course, Part of what we do as historians, you don't, you don't want to do that. You, you counter that. You want to make things more complex. You want to awaken students um, to paradoxes, complexities, nuances, and therefore allow them to understand this place a lot better. So do you find students today or do you teach it differently today where Soviet history is less about Russia at the center and it includes more of the republics around the edge so that there's more about what's happening in Estonia, what's happening in Tajikistan. Um, is that a, is that a bigger part of the, the Soviet Union? Definitely, Soviet? definitely. And a good part of it too. I mean, I think that's what the reckoning of the 1990s um, produced in a, in a very useful way. That is it, 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 both in the 19th century empire and before and in the 20th century Soviet Union, that there were millions of people who can't just be called Russian. 
although on some level maybe they can. Um, and to, to think about how this, let's say the Soviet state, since that's your question, um, incorporated, created even places like Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, what that meant, meant exactly, how, how Kazakh became an ethnic, national, and imperial set of identities that, you know, you know, evolved over the course of the 20th century, and, including, of course, the, the famine of the, of the 1930s, but also including the way in which Kazakhness developed as a concept in the, in the 20th century. And I, I, I think, I think students respond to that. Certainly I do intellectually. I think that's part of what we have to stress. And you also throw in some good Soviet movies. Exactly. I do. Um, in, in this case, uh, well, you know, I mean, there's, there are actually great Kazakh movies from the 1980s, the Kazakh new wave, the needle, um, um, starring Victor Soy, right. Who students like to, um, allows you to see that as well. Like the you know, other places that aren't just Moscow or St. Petersburg. Um, I do teach a lot of movies. I teach history at the movies. I use movies in my Soviet history class for all kinds of reasons. Um, I'm a big fan of Leonid Gaidai, the, the 1960s and 70s slapstick comedic director. I love Ivan Vasilievich, the Ivan Vasilievich changes his profession, um, where he goes back in time to the period of Ivan IV. It's it's silly. It's It has some good meanings. I think students respond because it, it allows them to see a side of the Soviet 1970s that they wouldn't otherwise see or even think existed, like th that these movies were popular, even tolerated, um, although they were problematic to some Soviet censors. But they still they did they did fantastic at the box office, um, and that it they coexisted interestingly at a time that is these Soviet comedies, uh, when slapstick comedies by you know Mel Brooks were popular in America. So there was something about the '60s and '70s that you know, film audiences wanted slapstick comedies. And that, that was true in the Soviet Union. It was true in America, too. I can't believe kids today still like those movies. Well, at least they tell me they do, Michael. But, <laughs> um, but you know, scenes from Ivan Vasilevich changes his profession are fantastic. I mean, the scene where Ivan IV ends up in Moscow in an elevator and, you know, Novi Cheryomushki or wherever it's set there and runs around. And then the way in which he translates so i mean the part of the plot is that essentially a, a mid-level apartment manager who's something of a tyrant who looks like ivan the fourth gets transported back to ivan the fourth time and ivan the fourth gets transported to the soviet union in 1972 um and they 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 function quite well in those roles that that is the mid-level soviet apartment manager can still get away with being ivan the fourth and you know the 1500s and ivan the fourth yeah he's, he's fine in the soviet union in the 1970s <laughs> This is based on a Bulgakov story. Yes, exactly. Yeah, which that I mean, that was actually one of the things that caused some consternation among Soviet censors is that um, um, it, it was based on a Bulgakov play, and actually Bulgakov's name appeared in the opening titles. It was the first time his name, I think, had appeared publicly in the Soviet Union since he'd been purged. So here it was, you know, Ivan Vasilyevich Minyak Professor, based on a story or a play by Mikhail Bulgakov. And that was early. Early 70s, 70s? Yes. Yeah, I think it came out in 73, made in 72. So, and suddenly was... my slides have popped up here, even though I, I did see, nothing. I see the book. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, do you want to um, advance your slides to um, Efimov and we can look at some of his cartoons? Sure, let's do that. Right, yeah. So them. first, first we'll go through a, 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 a well, this is this now get, provides visuals for my earlier statements about. <laughs> How Vasnetsov was became popular in a way. So here's here's how the Bagatiri was was reproduced on Neva, this very extraordinarily popular um, journal produced in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Here's Night at the Crossroads. How you know they were reproduced on World War One revolutionary era propaganda prints. This is on the on the right of the screen is a World War II postcard that simply reproduces um, Bagatiri here. Paintings, this is sort of meta right here, right? That yeah. is a painting of the painting and of Soviet audiences viewing the painting um, with Bogatiri there. Can I stop you there? Because yeah, sure. I was gonna ask you a question. Um, when you're in Moscow or when, when you were when you were researching this book and, and researching these artists, do you have any observations of like what we're looking at in this painting of, of Russian standing in front of a gigantic canvas of a mythologized Russian history? What are your observations, or how do you feel when when you're watching um, the the crowds in the in the Tretyakov or the Russian Museum look at these paintings? And and right, so have I'm, you ever listened to the the the, um, the teacher as they're telling the stories? I I do actually, and I have some examples from some archival work of the scripts that 
guides were told to use for Vasnitsov and Surikov. Really? Um, the the short interesting thing about this is that when, of course, the revolution happened, Vasnitsov and Surikov were 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 not, you know, the, the Bolsheviks weren't too fond of them because they they did myth history, right? The sort of history and moments in the past, empire building, creation of Russianness that the Soviets, the Bolsheviks were explicitly against. And it really was only in, in 1937, I think, 37 or 38, the, 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 so their paintings were taken off the walls of the Tretikov and the Russian Museum. And in 37 or 38, at somewhere the, around... At the, at the time of the revolution. Correct, yes. And they, they spent 20 years basically in storage. And then around 37, 38, there was a big exhibit of Russian historical paintings that the Stalinist system put on. And it was a way of kind of acknowledging that the, the power of these images and the powers of Russianness and Russian national identity still existed in the Soviet Union. And, and it was a way for the Stalinist state to kind of tap into that, appropriate it in a way that... that later proved useful to them in World War II. So that's how I read this. But so, so the first painting here is, this is now a painting allowing viewers to say, okay, it's okay to like Vlasnitsov again, but now we need to see him as somehow Soviet. I mean, you notice the person in the pioneer scarf in the front of the painting here. You notice the teacher telling them, this is about our deep past and the way patriotism and national identity function in the past. And that's what Vlasnitsov did. And that's what we now know in the Soviet Union, we too can love the motherland in Russia in the way they did. Um, and that's here's here's an actual an image from the Moscow News, the English language paper produced in 1938 of that exhibit. And you see the same thing, right? This, this very didactic image. It's a meta image. They too, they're looking at these Vasinsov paintings as great Russian paintings that in turn help us see ourselves as great Soviet citizens. I have all kinds of examples of this. They're fantastic. They all, they all look the same, don't they? They're, uh, it, the only thing that changes is across time. This is from the 1960s. It was published in a Soviet newspaper. Again, right? Soviet school children being brought to the Tretyakov to look at Vastinsov and Bagatiri and see them as, as Soviet. Here's Surikov, of course. So you asked about Yefimov. I'm happy to talk about him. I, that's the... Let's... Um, yes, it's... it's a, oh, good. So we're talking about... Um, Soviet history, you use Efimov as part of your um, the conversation of um, Russian Soviet attitudes towards the West, towards America. Um, tell us about Efimov. Yep. So the, 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 the transition here is that, you know, I've always been interested in visual sources. Um, Efimov I encountered for the first time in 1999. I watched a documentary on PBS here in America that he appeared in. And it was at the time when I was writing my dissertation on 19th century and early 20th century Lubki, the popular images. And I saw him as kind of like the next step, I guess, and phase in, in Russian, now Soviet visual propaganda. Um, many of the audience members might know who he is, but for those who don't, he, he's the most prolific propagandist in Soviet history. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm titling my book, um, you know, Communism's Cartoonist, The Extraordinary Lives and Deaths of Boris Efimov. He was born in 1900. Um, he was born again as, as Boris Friedlin um, in the Pale of Settlement, the uh, Jewish Pale of Settlement. He was Jewish. He was born again as Boris Efimov. He renamed himself like so many people did in 1917 in the midst of revolution. Um, he died to a certain extent in 1940 and 41 uh, during the purges because his brother was arrested and shot. He was briefly reborn again as V. Borisov. So he never stopped working, but he changed his name. And then he was resurrected in 1941 as Boris Efimov again when the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union. Uh, and then he spent, you know, the post-war era as Boris Efimov, the most significant visual satirist in the Soviet Union, and did that for the rest of his of the Soviet era. Um, so he he died. I mean, I, I don't know if we're counting here. That's three deaths now. In 1991, when the Soviet Union died, because he kind of lost that status. But then he found new life again in the late 1900s and 1990s. Sorry, in 2000s as someone who had lived so long. Um, so he, he actually died in 2008, just after his 108th birthday. Wow. Um, and I, I met him in 2008, just, I was probably the last Westerner oh. that he ever saw. I met him three months before his, he died. What you see here in these images, here he is working in the 1930s when he first became prominent. And here he is at one of his major retrospectives in the 1970s with Leonid Brezhnev. Um, Yefimov was older, six years older than Brezhnev, by the way. For those who know the Brezhnev era jokes, this means something. That is, Yefimov was older than Brezhnev and lived, Yefimov, that is, to, to 2008. That's incredible. So he he, he claimed, I mean, he, he made all these claims about how many cartoons he published. He, he would often, you know, he would say as many as 50,000 at times. 
uh, he, he for a long time would say 25 to 35,000. Um, the Soviet Union only existed for something like 27,000 days. So it's, 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 one has to take these claims with a grain of salt, but I, but I can tell you, he published at least 9,000 cartoons um, as an official propagandist and visual satirist in the Soviet Union. That's one for every three days the Soviet Union existed, um, which is extraordinary, right? That, and that fascinates me. Like, what does it mean to be a propagandist in this system from beginning to end? What does it mean to live throughout the entirety of the Soviet period, as an adult even, because he turned 17 in 1917? Um, and, and how does, how do you survive this? You know, how, how do you keep doing what you're doing? Which is, he was a, a the principal political caricaturist for Izvestia, worked for Crocodile as well, the satirical magazine, um, from 1922 when they were, when he was named principal caricaturist for Izvestia, all the way to, on some level, 1991. So what was his ideology? Did he, did he believe all of this? Did he ever go to the United States? He didn't. No, he did travel somewhat. Um, and, and, you know, I smile because that's the, that's the question most people ask. And it's the hardest one to answer because he was very slippery. He, he, he tended, he wrote beginning in the 1960s, a lot of uh, memoirs and he sort of always slightly changed things as the times changed to allow more information to be published. Um, but he, he wrote most of these in a very passive style. It was like history acted upon him. You know, I, I just happened to find myself meeting with Trotsky. Um, or happened to find myself being called by Stalin. And he always also projected uh, the belief that is a true belief in the Soviet system on his older brother, Mikhail Koltsov, who also renamed himself and became the editor of Pravda in the 30s and was sent as a correspondent to the Spanish Civil War and wrote a very um, well-read book called The Spanish Diary and then was arrested in 38, tortured and shot. So it was it was older brother who brought him into the fold, who, you know, kind of, made him move to Moscow, who was the real believer. And it was a way, Yefimov did this again and again across time to, of deflecting questions about how much he really believed in the system. It's also a way of deflecting his complicity and helping to create the system that ultimately arrested and killed his brother. He was just an artist. He was, he was capturing the times. That's what he so, would say. Do you have some examples of his anti-Western Yes, you do. I do, as a matter of fact. Yeah. So he, you know, he he first became prominent in 1924 when he. I mean, so he was he was not even yet 24 years old when his first um, collected edition of his cartoons was published in the Soviet Union. Um, for Russian speakers and readers, you can see here the 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 one thing that loomed over him in the next decade was the introduction was written by Leon Trotsky, his his political patron, who was also his brother's political patron. That would come back to play a major role in his brother's arrest and even. Yefimov's own fear that he would be arrested. But here, here's one of his first examples of what, he, you know, he he produced a lot of anti-Western caricatures. This is called the um, Madhouse Europe, which, at the, you know, included Mussolini and Pilsudski and other leaders at the time, and saw the West as hypocritical, backward, crazy even, for continuing to promote imperialism or grab for oil, as you can see. This is Austin Chamberlain, the British foreign minister grabbing for oil in the right, that, that, that there was in the West um, a veneer of democracy, supposedly, that really underneath was hypocrisy. And that was a recurring theme in his, his images. Here's some from the 30s where that another theme was that behind every horrific movement, and in this case, fascism, whether it be in a, a Lithuanian form that's on the left, or the Nazis, which he warned against early on, it's a cartoon from 1923, um, that there was some hand of a, a capitalism or Western leaders bringing about and fomenting um, these deadly regimes. Here's some examples. This is what, you know, his way of dealing with a Stalinist system. Maybe people in the audience know these cartoons well. Yefimov was the author of pro-Stalinist cartoons, the capital captain of the Soviet ship leading us from victory to victory, or the purge era cartoons of Yezhov's Iron Fist, you know, crushing uh, the early Bolsheviks, including his political patron Trotsky. This is how Yefimov tried to, you know, redeem himself in the eyes of the Stalinist system um, for Save earlier us. being patronized. Yes. And then here's his brother, Mikhail Koltsov, the one, a famous painting or a picture on the right, the other, his, his mugshot from the NKVD. Um, so that, as I said, that's one aspect of Yefimov's life. One one thing I trace in the book is is the way he survived for this entire century. His brother did not. And the way he consistently asked himself, you know, again and again, and really again and again, you have to say it, um, did he have agency 
in the system? Did, did he have a choice? Did he help in some ways create the very system that arrested his brother and murdered him? And just as proof of the way he thought about this, this is when I met him. Here I am in 2008. Here's Yefimov at 107 years old. This is his dacha outside Moscow. And you can see behind us is, you know, his what he sat and looked at, his television. On the other side, so what we're looking at, in addition to the photographer, the only thing on the wall is Isaac Brodsky's painting of his brother. He stared at his brother, you know, hour after hour at the end of his life, thinking these thoughts, right? That what does it all mean? What have I done? And he would deflect any serious questions, you know. I was just an artist or I had to do what I had to do. You know, we have we have a comment here. It's it's um uh he speak very positively about Russia. They try to impose exceptionally bad things about the United States on us at schools. Do you think this is normal? So that's a fair question, you know, and um, I, I do think, you know, we, Steve, you and I and others do have a very positive, you know, feelings towards Russia. But, you know, what 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 do your students think when they see this? And they're like, what are, what are the Russians? Because, you know, this is from, you know, the, the war, um, but you see this still today. Um, so what what do your students say about all of the Russian propaganda aimed our way? Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 this is not a Yefimov-like way to deflect this question, Michael, although I will say in saying that I'm a historian, I teach, you know, history classes. So part of this is a, a way of explaining the way in which, um, especially in the Soviet period, an image of the West was constructed that was largely negative and that persists in some ways in Russia today. But, uh, you know, I also contrast it where possible and where I have some knowledge with the way in which the image of the Soviet Union was created in America. I mean, I'm very early on in this conversation, I referenced Red Dawn and Rocky IV. That was, that was the Soviet Union slash Russia to me as a, as a young teenager. Um, and so, you know, we had these imaginaries created for us, you know, the, the, uh, that we, you know, sometimes accepted, sometimes not. I mean, I think one of the interesting things I get to teach, particularly in, in the latter half of the Soviet history course, using books like Alexei Yorchak's book about everything was forever until it was no more, was the way in which many Soviet citizens responded to the imaginary West created by Yefimov and other propagandists and created an alternative West that was, you know, more fun, freer, things like that. And I think that was, you know, it was true in America uh, in the Cold War era too. This is this is ultimately a way of answering your question. That there were these images, Rocky Four like images of the Soviet Union, but there were books like Doctor Zhivago or Life and Fate that were published in the United States, translated books like One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, or works by Tolstoy and Dostoevsky that you could still access and maybe you know think a little more uh, in a little more nuance about Russia slash the Soviet Union. But there definitely was a, you know, to, to whoever asked this question, of course, there was a similar, when you ask if this is normal, um, I think it is normal. You know, I think it, it was normal in the United States to have that very anti-Soviet um, spin. And when I went to the Soviet Union, you know, students at, um, students in my school called me communist, you know, people thought it was crazy. And, you know, so, yeah, I think that it's just part of life. Yeah. 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 And, and you know, positive. I, it's, I, well, I don't want to go too much into this, I guess, but I don't know if it's positive or negative. I, I, I There are positive and negative elements of Russian culture and Russian history. I mean, that, that just is right. Just as, like there are of any histories. And it's my job, I think, to stress complexity. Sure. And so what are we looking at now? Yeah. So if we want to look more at some Yefimov cartoons, um, well, here, I'll, I'll slide back to the one I, I... One answer that Yefimov gave to this question about whether he was complicit in the Soviet period always revolved around one story. And actually, when I met him, he told me this story, too. He, he tended to have scripts um, that he always stuck to when responding to interviewers because they, they asked questions like you. Did you did you believe? You know, what, what do you think about this, the Stalinist period? Were you complicit? And so he would tell this story where... Um, in 1947, he was called by one of Stalin's henchmen and told he needs to make a cartoon for his vestia, and it needs to be about the growing military presence of the of America in the Arctic. So he he did this. He called it um, Eisenhower's Defense Line, and he what you see here is a journalist that is taken from a quote in a newspaper of asking why Eisenhower, uh, 
um, this is before he's president, he's still commander of the American forces, is deploying so much weaponry. And Eisenhower answers, can't you see that the enemy is here and that the threat to America is clear? So he submitted this very cartoon that you're looking at to the editors of Izvestia. And about a day later, he got a call back from one of Stalin's henchmen and said, Stalin liked this cartoon and he remembers you, but he wants you to know that there aren't penguins in the North Pole. So you can see here. And so then this was the edited version that was published in Izvestia the next day, no penguins. So Yefimov told this story because it allowed him to say, when he heard the words Stalin remembers you, he got a chill because it meant that maybe Stalin was acknowledging that he had had his brother arrested and killed and that he could do this at any time. What's interesting, so it also allows us to see the way the West was constructed, right? That, you know, over militaristic, putting their nose in places they shouldn't, at least the way it was constructed in the Soviet Union. Um, it allowed Yefimov to take the, the, the extraordinary and make it ordinary. It, it turns out Stalin rarely if ever called Yefimov or intervened in his work. This is one of maybe three or four instances total in his long political career. But it, you can see where he, why he would use it. it. It sort of allows people to think, oh yes, you could always be called and called out by Stalin. So you had to toe the line. And it was the way he would always avoid more probing questions about complicity. Right. Here, just to give you some examples of um, what he did across time, he, he, he also wove kind of visual patterns. He, he created some early on in his career in the 1920s and he consistently adapted them given the circumstances. So I, I would kind of call this the two worlds phenomenon. He always created a, a contrast between the, the glorious Soviet world, which really believed in peace and democracy. That's what's on the left. Um, on the right is the Brezhnev constitution of 1977. You see the very same pattern here, right? And underneath is the decrepit, um, hypocritical, militaristic world of the West. Here you see America appearing. This is from 1949 on the left um, so, in the form of a capitalist, right? Clutching the almighty dollar. Right, the capitalist, the almighty dollar. Um, there's a question about that almighty dollar, about the late Soviet period when you teach Soviet history. Um, how do your students um, see the transition from socialism to capitalism, this commercialization, Americanization of, of Russian culture and how do you discuss this positively, critically? Um, so this, yeah, the, the the same way I would any other uh, topic. That it's it's a mixture of both, um, t told through mostly experiences. Insofar as I, we can recover them from the 1990s. I mean, the the history of the Soviet Union class I teach ends, you know, the last week or so is the 1990s and early 2000s. I mean, you know, most historians like myself don't don't want to get too embedded in the present in a history class. So we, you know, 20, 25 sure. years is as far back as we're willing to go. Um, but some of that is, uh, some of the way you teach the 1990s is of course this, again, extraordinary, in some cases quite negative, in some cases quite positive, uh, transition from one system, um, economic and political to another, the way in which the imagined West didn't always live up to the reality of encountering an actual West in the 1990s, the way in which, um, Russians struggled, of course, across the 1990s, people in the former Soviet Union, um, both politically and economically, um, in terms of uh, how they they just tried to make their way through life, um, but also the way in which some, po you know, late Soviet tendencies, you know, revived and evolved in the 1990s. So that, that's a maybe too long a way of saying it. Complexity is the name of the game here, not positive versus negative. It's, it just helps us and helps students understand this transition uh, that was rough for everyone in the former Soviet Union, not just in what was now the Russian Federation, but all these new republics. But I think what I would, you talk about presenting the, the complexities. And what I would say is, you know, it, to help answer that question is, it's not presented as, ah, oh, you know, it's, it's become a capitalist um, co a country and a capitalist economy and everything's, everything was wonderful thanks to us. I think that we also recognize and we are taught that it was a very difficult time, that there were a lot of problems, and it wasn't this glorious transition to capitalism. Correct. I, and you know, one thing I do stress, I guess, is that um, I think, and this is mostly aimed at my student audience, that there there tends to be um, a, a, a belief that the United States was entirely responsible for the end of the Cold War. Um, I don't know, like 
that the, everything the United States did re was responsible for ending the Cold War. And therefore, there, t there also tends to be that whatever went right or wrong in Russia in the 1990s was the responsibility of the United States. There, there tends to be a very American-centric way of viewing things um, mm -hmm. in American classrooms. So, you know, of course, what I try to do is explain that's not the case. I mean, in the case of the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, Poles, Russians, all kinds of peoples in the Soviet Union took to the streets and, and acted in their own dramas and helped bring about change. And the same is true of the 1990s. It wasn't just, you know, America lost Russia, as often was said in the 1990s. It's that the way in which these changes took place and were adapted by Russians living in Russia explains um, what happened next, that 10-year period, and even more. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, by the way, is a direct response to these images you, you see on the screen, which are Yefimov Soviet propaganda that the West was behind everything, that behind every event, whether it's uh, Vietnam or Cambodia were, was some nefarious now American general um, doing something. And that's what the truth really was. You had to kind of look beyond to see the conspiracy. Um, the left is the Vietnam War and Cambodia, and the right is so-called Star Wars, the Strategic Defense Initiative under Reagan. This is a 19... So you have a 1961 and a 1985 cartoon that essentially stress visually the same thing, that there's, there's a plot going on here that the West needs to be uncovered doing. Um, a couple a couple questions have come in asking for um, your recommendations or your favorite Soviet um, and Russian authors and also uh, books that you recommend. You mentioned Yurchak's um, book. Um, so if you would like to share those as we go along too, as you know, we're getting close to time. So if you want to share some of your um, preferences for um, books, perhaps texts that you use in your classes um, by Americans or by Russians? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a, f in terms of Soviet history, I'm a big fan of Stephen Lovell's very short introduction through Oxford. I mean, I love these very short books. I, I now edit a series called Russian Shorts. Um, I think what Lovell does well is in an accessible form, you know, 40,000 words, is explain the Soviet Union as one that, it, that kind of created deep paradoxes. That is, coercion yet participation to um, a, a, a forward thinking culture while at the same time a culture that reflected on the past and that rather than see these as you have to choose one over the other that instead it tells us something about the Soviet Union itself that, that it was this sort of paradoxical place um, and I, I like that because I think it helps my students grasp things more complexly um, I like in terms of the shorts books I edit Bridget O'Keefe just wrote a book about the concept of the friendship of peoples and the way that Soviet empire evolved across the 20th century and changed. That's fantastic it, because it really does include the voices of ordinary Soviet citizens, whether it be a Tajik woman or a, a, you know, a, a non-Russian living in Moscow. They're, they're, they're included in her book. And so you really do see the way in which so many different people lived in and experienced um, the Soviet experiment. And then, you know, look, uh, any time to plug Tolstoy or Grossman again, Look to it, you know, if you haven't read Vasily Grossman's Stalingrad, followed by Life and Fate, they're fantastic. Following the Shaposhnikovs across time is well worth your effort. For someone who likes short histories, you sure do love long novels. Yeah, right. That's right. Um, um, <laughs> paradoxes, Michael. That's, yeah, paradox. that's the name of the game. Very complex. <laughs> what is this? So uh, another theme in the Yefimov construction of the West, um, particularly in the late Soviet period, you know, that is what, what ostensibly the title of our talk is, um, was to shine a light on uh, American racism at home and to use that as a way of propping up the, way, the this other world, right? That the Soviet Union didn't have, supposedly didn't have racism and that the Soviet Union wasn't hypocritical in the way the United States was. So there was, a, especially in the 60s, but even as stretching back to the 1940s when this cartoon was made, 1947, the way in which you know an African American soldier fought in World War II for supposedly freedom and democracy, and then was discriminated against at home, um, became a, a really prominent theme in Yefimov's cartoons of the 1960s and 70s. So here, Abe Lincoln in 1961 looking at the revival of the Ku Klux Klan and saying, "A hundred years later, you know, how can this be?" Um, uh, the other one here is 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 entitled um, March of American Liberty. So you see the way he just quite clearly contrasts this, you know, the the idea, supposed idea of America as a mask for um, oppression. It also mentions Cincinnati, which is near where I live in here. This is based on the riots of 1967 and 68. And so, yeah, again and again, 
seeing American racism as as proof of the hypocritical West and the West that was remained crazy in the 1960s and 70s in the way it had in the 1920s. This is a 1966 cartoon contrasted to that 1923 cartoon I showed you earlier. That's that's the West across time. It, it's in some ways, I mean, it it evolves. He, he's able to slot contemporary situations into his cartoons, but in, in this case particularly, this is sort of the essence of Yefimov's propaganda. The, the West remain in important ways remarkably static. It was always corrupt, always crazy, always led by warmongers, whether they be Austin Chamberlain or some US cowboy type. Um, it, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's been the same, in other words. And these were fairly ubiquitous. I mean, again, you know, one cartoon for every three days of the Soviet existence at least. So people encountered them on some level. Some had to look at Yefimov's vision of the West on some level. Do you, do you pass out copies of Clark and Deal to your students? I do. Well, we, you know, fortunately, we have the entire digital archive at our in our library collection. So we use that. We also have the Moscow News, um, the English language newspaper published from the 30s all the way through the 2000s um, through our library digital collection, in part through the Havinghurst Center that I run. Um, and students really respond well to that. I mean, it's really interesting for them to read, again, language being a barrier here, but to read translated articles from Pravda Rizvestia in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, so on and so forth um, in English and think about how events were covered from the Soviet perspective. And then what's also interesting about Moscow News and Crocodile for that matter is, you know, around 85, 86, that is when Gorbachev was in power, they, ch they both changed dramatically. Moscow News went from being propagandistic to being more like a real, you know, uh, investigative journalist of paper. And you can track that, you know, just by simply reading through issues. I imagine your students find it interesting. If, if you back up to the last slide, there was a an, another image of the, of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, students must find it um, somewhat disturbing that these images could still be used today in some ways. Yes, yeah, right. I mean, you know, uh, um, worth saying, I suppose, uh, successful propaganda at least rests on some kernels of truth. What it does is flatten out nuance and complexity um, in order to, to make things into black and white, but it, especially when it is successful and resonates, it's because it rests on an essential truth. Um, look, John F. Kennedy, when he became president, talked a lot about the way in which, in his notes you know, to his advisors, that the Soviets seemed to be winning some one battlefront in the cultural cold war by by constantly referencing american racism because kennedy understood it was it was true but he also understood that this was oversimplifying things and wanted um you know some answer from the american perspective to to counter this and and that's why again you know from now back to yefimov why he returned to this theme again and again it was useful right to say this was this is the west this is america they, they promised democracy supposedly but you get institutionalized racism Um, can we finish on a completely unrelated topic? Um, and that's about Moscow apartments. <laughs> um, um, you and I were talking about how you had, um, you, you wrote a chapter for a book about, um, Russian film and how they rep and how they sort of established Moscow as a, as, as you called it, a Moscow text for the city as home. Can you talk about that? Because, you know, one of the things that I miss about going to Russia is sitting in my friend's apartments and hanging out and drinking vodka. And that I, I love the idea of the, the Moscow apartment text. What, what is what is what is your story there? Yeah, the, the, the story there. So this is a book I co-edited called The, the City and Russian Culture. Um, so I, I I for lots of reasons, started watching a lot of movies, Soviet Russian movies in the 2000s. Um, and also was teaching courses and it had taught a course coinciding with the 300th anniversary of St. Petersburg about the so-called Petersburg text, which I think is familiar to most scholars and probably people in the audience that is this notion created in the 19th century through writers like Dostoevsky and even Tolstoy and others that Petersburg was artificial. Um, Pushkin played a big role in this too, that it had been created on a swamp and that, you know, so on and so forth. There's a, there's a, a lot of understanding and a lot of scholarly work on the Petersburg text. A little less so on anything to do with Moscow as a as a place and a space. So I noticed in watching all these movies from the beginning to the end in the Soviet Union, um, Moscow did have 
a symbolic role as, as sort of homey. Um, and in particular, in the way in which the Soviet Union was explained on screen to Soviet audiences, that the apartment functioned as an important vehicle for hominess, right? So, um, coziness. It, yeah, right. Or, um, and, and, and the need to be changed, to be revolutionized, to be inhabited by people who weren't necessarily from Moscow originally. That is, Soviet citizens moving from the village to the city. There, there, there are entire movies about this, many movies about this who need to decorate their home, get an apartment somehow, acquire one, and then decorate it properly. Girl with a hat box is a good example of this from the from the 30s. Um, and the, but also the way, especially one of my favorite movies, The Extraordinary um, Adventures of Mr. West in the Land of the Bolsheviks, Lev Gulashov from the 20s, that old Alt Moscow apartments could could and it could, could be populated by dangerous types. The criminal gang in it lives in an apartment that they haven't changed. And then at the end, Mr. West has taken on a tour of the city as it's changing. And that, that's sort of like the foundational text of this chapter. And then across time, you can see how movies again and again, you know, return to these apartments um, and invested them with a lot of meaning about what it meant to be Soviet. And not just what it meant to be Soviet, but also what the Soviet experiment meant across time. Uh, and then and the culmination is, you know, late Soviet movies um, like Courier, Karin Shaknazarov's movie Courier, which is set in Moscow too, where now the apartment is dysfunctional, the family is ruined, it's dirty, the kid, the courier of the title, is nihilistic about belief systems, he just wants to escape and hang out with his girlfriend and, you know, sort of cause trouble. And it, you know, it's it's sort of like the book into the early Soviet envisioning of the apartment as the place where Sovietness is going to be made. Now, in 1986, when that movie came out, it's failed. Or, or Taxi Blues, the Pavel Lungin's um, late Soviet uh, movie. It, it, and it's it's just really interesting, I think, that the in this way, a Moscow text was created about the apartment. And that, as you mentioned, Michael, um, most of us have vivid memories of the function of the apartment and the kitchen table. And that was captured on screen um, a lot. Well, this conversation has been just as interesting as many that I've had at, at Russian kitchen tables. Thank you so much for talking to us today. Um, and thanks to the audience. We went a little over than what we normally do, but there's a lot to talk about. So Steve, thank you very much for joining us today. And um, I'd like to thank the American Center in Moscow for, for supporting this program. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.